Hello and welcome to another episode of Don't Shit on the Bus. I'm your host, Adam Omokais, tuning in all the way from Los Angeles, California, for episode number 95 with my new good friend, Paul. Now, Paul is an important person in the touring music industry because he is one of the founders, creators, and current CEO of an app called Master Tour. Now, Master Tour falls under a larger category called Eventric. Now, Master Tour is an app that tour managers use to put basically all the information into the tour on. They'll say what venue you're playing, what the address is, capacity, uh, are there dressing rooms, are there showers? It's everything you need to know about that venue for that day, for every day of tour. And this was created a while ago by Paul and his partner. I encourage you to go sign up for the app and take a look around. It's You will have the link in the caption, check it out. And if you've been on tour, you know what this app is. Everybody's got it on their phone. If you're a tour manager, use it all the time. And it's just how you get all the information you need on the road. It's one of the best things ever created. So thank you, Paul. And today we talked about, you know, how he created it. Cause I was interested and I was like, okay, we've got this piece of kind of history in the touring music industry. We've got the creator on like, I want to know how you got here, how you made it. In addition to that, we talked about how COVID affected their app and their career and their company. And then what they have coming up, what features are being added to the app moving forward. Because this app, like I started using it, I don't know, like 10 years ago, it was a bit clunky as any app is in early production times. And even just 10 years ago is different technology, but it's getting better and it's really good now. And they're growing and becoming more and more efficient and effective place and resource for everything you need on the road. So it's cool. And yeah, Paul, thank you for coming on here. Thank you for sharing your knowledge, your wisdom, your thoughts on the touring music industry. And thank you for your contributions and making everybody's life a lot easier. We appreciate you. All right, before we get into the episode, of course, thank you to our patrons for signing up their weekly contributions to support this podcast. Obviously could not do this without you. We appreciate you. So thank you so much for doing that. I look forward to meeting all of you in real life when you're on tour and you stop through LA and hopefully come to Burbank. Because LA is a big place and I can't always meet up with people, but I try my best. So if you're in Burbank area, I'll, I'll come meet you. Uh, with that being said, I hope you enjoyed this episode of Don't Shit on the Bus. I'll see you next week. Hey, Paul, thanks for uh, coming on the podcast. How are you doing, man? Great. Thanks for having me. And before we get into anything, I just want to say thank you for creating Master Tour. Oh, that's my pleasure. It's, uh, it's been a 30-year startup, so I love hearing that. <laughs> It's 30 years now. I got, it's got to reform some. Like, I thought it was like 20 or so, but you start, I looked it up and you like started while you were on tour, kind of. Well, I mean, it depends on who's asking. Like okay. If you're I'm asking. The IRS, <laughs> if you're family, if you're a client, you know, if yeah. you're an investor. So, no, I mean, it, 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 and I really don't have an exact, exact date. Yeah. You know, this wasn't like, hey, I thought of this idea. Let's go incorporate and boom, you know, next day it was launched. I mean, it was really, you know, 10 years in the making throughout the 90s um, between me and collaborators, um, you know, across the touring industry primarily. So, yeah, I mean, I would say officially, well, I mean, it, the start started with my co-founder, Ian Kuhn, monitoring mm -hmm. engineers extraordinaire for everybody. I mean, he was originally with the Smashing Pumpkins, then he was with my band in the 90s, then he went with Dave Matthews. He and I originally incorporated a company called Production Consultants Guild, Inc., which okay. was a beautiful name, a wonderful name. Surprisingly, that URL was available. Um, <laughs> actually, the URL was PC Guild. We'd answer the phone, PCG. Our product was Master Tour Database, MTD, which we did have the website for. So, I mean, it was like it, it was like a marketing 101 catastrophe that we had. But uh, originally, Ian and I started the, the company as kind of a consulting company. I mean, I think he okay. actually had the name before. But anyway, but it, it was more of just like, hey, we do databases. We do websites. And, you know, so it, there, there was no intent. I think it was, if I remember correctly, when we incorporated in 2000, it was really, we got our first check from someone. We're like, how the hell, how does this work? Yeah. You can't just like, yeah, we can't just like, you know, Ray Leota and launder the money. We have to actually go put it into a legit bank account. Yeah. I mean, you started as like just the back end of it, right? I mean, eventually you got this UI and it's much more user friendly and people can access it on their own. But before it was like, we have this data and people came to you kind of one-on-one -on -one and you provided it to them. Is that correct? Yeah. Well, I mean, it, yeah. It, it, I mean, there's a two hour version of the story and like a four minute version of the story, but <laughs> I'm here for either. I'll sit, I'll listen. So the, this, let's say, let's call it six, seven minute version of the story is I got into the music business just 
out of chance. I was a, a student in Des Moines, Iowa, Drake University, just started bringing in or promoting bands locally, you know, at okay. the local, I mean, totally independent of the university or any, any legitimate promotion company, totally not insured, not bonded. And we just would hire bands and bring them into small clubs. I'm sure hundred percent illegally um, selling tickets like by hand. Then we had the nice. opportunity to bring in some bigger bands, you know, kind of the big college bands of the era, the big head Todd's, the samples, the Matthews band, uh, Freddie Jones band. Um, so we, we, uh, a couple of buddies and I brought them into again, small theaters, total cash business, total. Um, I think the statute of limitations is on this to get in any trouble, but, uh, we <laughs> definitely sold tickets, cash, you know, hand to hand, like no legit. I mean, we were selling them out of a skateboard shop, um, at one point, but then, uh, that got me really interested in the business side of it. But the first, one of the first, like we had Todd shows we did, I remember getting the rider, um, you know, from, I, I wish I remember the agency cause it was like, it, it was some icon agent that was calling. And I later was just so mortified that I was, it was like a Frank Riley, I think, or just someone that was beyond, you know, the leaders of the industry. And I, I, I just sounded like such a fool because yeah. it was the first show and it, and so we sent the writer, you know, like a 20 page writer and got, to, we got everything down to the grapes, to the tablecloth, to the napkins, to the 27 knives. And I remember, <laughs> I remember Todd, when the pen walking into the dressing room, it was a Sunday night, like in a small 500 seat. He was like, who's this for? I'm like, well, it's for you guys. This is in the writer. He's like, yeah, we don't usually, you don't usually have to get all of the stuff on a writer. I'm like, I didn't know that. <laughs> we got plenty of leftovers. Then. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> So that got, that, that got me interested in that business. Not that I thought I was going to be a promoter or an agent, but um, anyway, graduated, finally moved back to Chicago. And through a connection of my father's, we, I started working for this small band who was working out of a, a, a small future restaurant in kind of the Southport area of Chicago next to the Mercury Theater. This was a, um, a kind of a small Chicago independent record label. And I, I, just, I just was interning. I was just doing anything they wanted. Um, one of the primary bands there was called the Drovers. Uh, eventually I became the drummer in the band. And before that, oh, I was cool. just doing every, er, everything possible. I, I was, you know, running errands. Uh, they were recording their second album at the time. So, you know, going back and forth to CRC in Chicago and just really doing everything. And then eventually I started kind of booking the band and doing a little bit of management, a little bit of tour management. And during that time, I built just a, a kind of offer management contracting system through uh, FileMaker to track all the contracts the day sheets and you know just the general traveling of the bank because they were touring a lot what's filemaker what's filemaker that dates you filemaker was like the go-to do-it-yourself database creation tool okay i don't know cool there used to be claris works i mean and, and that's just it, you know i was not trained in technology um or computer science in any capacity it was a very learn on your own do it yourself build a database gotcha so anyway i built this kind of small contracting system just to collect the information from this record label went on the road and then just by totally happenstance my um the smashing pumpkins stopped touring for a little bit and you know they, they were playing sheds at the time and we were very friendly with all their crew through the metro in chicago connection because they all worked there we all went there and hung out with the kind of chicago scene this is mid-90s so for some reason, my band, uh, the Drovers, that I was drumming in at the time and tour managing, we and were like, hey, we need, you know, we're a five-piece band in a van and trailer, so we need five crew guys with us because it totally makes <laughs> One sense. One for each member. Yeah, right. When you're when you're playing 300-seaters, you know, in Wichita, you need, yeah, yeah. In, in a van, you need five crew guys. But the greatest part of that is, is you know, we met these unbelievable guys that some are still touring today. Um, one of the guys, Ian Kuhn, uh, he and I collected, he had built... Uh, and, and sorry, Ian, everyone, we could be, I could be butchering this. This was not 30 years ago, but he, but he had built some software for the Smashing Pumpkins. When he and I were touring, we kind of got excited about what I had built, what he had built. Flash forward years later, Ian's touring with as a monitor engineer for Dave Matthews Band. I'm, I'm winding down touring because um, mm -hmm. I, I realized this wasn't a lifestyle that was going to be very supportive, you know, both financially, mentally, physically. So I, we, you know, was kind of, I uh, was getting married at the time and winding, looking for something to do. Ian and I reconnected and at some point, eventually, that was the creation of Master Tour, the original Master Tour databases. The Dave Matthews Band could, you know, kind of put a lot of input into it when Ian brought that to those guys. Can't remember what year, but at some point we collaborated and said, hey, this could, this looks pretty cool. We've got other bands, you know, Neil Young, Beastie Boys, Food Fighters, Chili Peppers, Metallica, just by the association of Dave Matthews, you know, we were, we were allowed, we were giving the original version away on a CD run. Yeah. Because, you know, at the time, everything, that was touring was just done on either Excel, three ring binders. I mean, it was, it was 
understandably our kid. There was just no, you know, the touring industry wasn't big enough to have a built-in infrastructure for data management for systems and processes. Because I mean, as you know, it's all guys like us, like you, like Andrew Weiss, that you know are self-taught in their own discipline of the industry. Mm -hmm. And you know, no in the opportunity that I realized later that we had was that each touring entity is mostly filled with subcontract workers. You know, that touring entity gets created and dissolved in some sense over the course of a tour or after. Mm -hmm. So there's really not like it's not like you're working for a traditional corporate structure where there's systems and you know the playbooks and employee handbooks and all this stuff you're just kind of thrown in and, and you run with whatever they're using at the time so it really took years and years and years of perfecting master tour just listening to tons of people i mean most of our and most of them are kind of the legends of the industry now that have been touring for you know 30 mm -hmm. plus years we were we were fortunate to get uh, connected with them and they were very vocal about what master tour needed you know how it could work what we heard most of the time of what didn't work we, you know it was crashing it was it was still built in this file maker thing me and i were doing you know running everything managing the software uh you know all the feature requests you know all of that development was still just done by two people for the most part so it was very challenging to scale it uh, i had no really uh, idea how to run or build it as a business and this is all through the early 2000s you know into, yeah. it was right around 2000 different world totally different world and it was right right about 2008, um, seven, that it was just a horrific example of why the software wasn't working. It, it completely crashed for a massive event on a guest list, huge, huge uh, local show for one of our clients guest list crashed that night in our system. And nice. I'm sure. That went really well. <laughs> that's the, I, I mean, God bless them. It was a Canadian band and they were just like, Hey man, it's really unfortunate, but yeah, the entire guest list crashed. And, uh, we're, you know, we understand things happen. I'm like, you should. I'm like, I'm glad this wasn't like a band out of Anaheim that, that yeah. this happened to. It was a bunch of very first Show up at your front door. Canadians. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but that was when I realized that, man, this is really an opportunity to create a platform and build yeah. a business. So again, without knowing anything about fundraising or business plans or, you know, the corporate structure, I pulled together a, a small business plan and just went out on a friends and family round to raise some money to hire actual developers and actual, you know, C-level executives that could run and help me build the business. I mean, I think, you know, one of the things I, I realized early on, you know, is just understanding my limitations. And I was uh, always willing to learn and to like dive into things, but, you know, I, I didn't have the discipline to say, man, I need to understand these contracts better. I'm going to go to law school. Hey, I need to you know, understand, you know, what the difference is between an S corp and an LLC. I need to go to get my business degree. Yeah. I was like, eh, why, why don't I just try to find a way to hire people that really understand this, you know, and know this immediately. Yeah. That's their specialty. Yeah. And they, they yeah. probably love it and, too, in a weird way. Yeah. And like <laughs> things, small things like developers. I'm like, yeah, I probably should hire real developers that know how to build really, you know, really thick ass software. So, you know, that's 2008. We raised, uh, went through a series A round, built a great team around it. This is when we shifted from the awesome PC Guild uh, brand to Eventric, which uh, yeah. uh, was a, the, the names that we almost became are borderline just embarrassing. And I, what were they? Oh, no, I can't even. It's, it's, I, I think I've erased that part of my mind just oh, out yeah. of sheer, <laughs> sheer relief that eventually became the name because it does still hold up on what we do because we we always thought well touring might not be the end result here you know, mm -hmm. this is all about events and uh so event i can't remember how who but eventually came up you know kind of as the parent company underneath the products that we have including master tour so i think that was eight i think it was like eight minutes that was like the eight minute version. oh no you're good man i was i was actually excited today because i was like i gotta sit down and kind of listen to the stories behind all these things that I'm really interested in. And it's cool. The things that stuck out for me, it was, you were, you were so fortunate to have these like large artists to sandbox this off of, because I feel like that's where a lot of people fail. You know, they either don't come from the industry or they think they know what's best. And you had the combination of coming from the industry and having people to try it out. And then in real time, being able to adjust and grow accordingly, which if people don't know, like that R and D is really a big part of, a company. So I, w I was wondering though, while you're going through that, you're talking about what everybody else is, you had to hire other specialists on for. What are you? Are you like a data guy? Like, what do you like a lot? Like what made you want to do this? Uh, I mean, the industry made me yeah. want to do this. I mean, okay. the, the realization that I wasn't going to be you know, like a arena level drummer, um, yeah. that came very quickly. It, and, you know, I mean, that's, it was by far talented enough to be 
an arena level drummer, but you know, it's also luck. And, yeah. you know, there's plenty of arena level drummers that aren't that great because they've had that, you know, combination of, of enough skill, persistence and, and talent, you know, to be in that band, to have those yeah. lucky breaks. Um, I mean, the band I was in, we, we, you know, kind of went, I was fortunate to start playing with them when they were pretty successful, you know, so I skipped the, like, for the most part, playing at the 50 seater, you know, with no one showing up clubs. So and we, we did our terrible share of those shows when you're in, you know, Red Deer, Canada, you know, or in, you know, Santa Monica and some skateboard club that we should have been booked <laughs> in. But I mean, then I, then I only knew I couldn't be a drummer just because it wasn't happening. You know, yeah. now in, in a lot of senses, I just, you know, a lot of people that tour, you know, and it's even at that level, at arena level, being a musician is, is challenging. I mean, I, I don't think people outside their industry understand that they think, oh, boo-hoo, you know, poor rockster has to decide what private jet to use or, which, yeah. you know, for seasons season to stay in it. And it's, it's at every level challenging. And I even have sympathy for some of the, at the biggest levels, because at the end of the day, you're away from any sort of normal lifestyle, sleep schedules, you know, diet consistency, you know, workout health, mental health, physical health. To answer your question, being, you know, I was not a technologist. I had nothing in, you know, I was always into gear and into just tweaking things. Yeah. Solving problems. Yeah. Yeah. You know, but never through, I mean, I, you know, I graduated in 93 and that was, and I took one computer science class and the entire final was to send an email. Like you had to construct an email <laughs> client. And if, you're, if the professor got the email, you'd pass. Wow. How, how far we've come in like 30 years how far is mind come. blowing. Yeah. It's crazy. You know, yes, about R&D. And, and again, this was not a traditional startup. You know, I, yeah. I spent, you know, we, we, we spent five years of doing other types of database projects and consulting gigs kind of while, you know, the origins of master tour were brewing in the background. And then, you know, it was, it was, I think the first time a band besides the Dave Matthews band said, yeah, I'm interested in using this. That was like, Oh, well shit, this could be a lot cooler than building out databases for financial purposes or something. Yeah. So I just wanted to be in this. I love the people that I had known at that point. You know, it's a crazy community of, of uh, you know, a lot of delinquents that make up some of the most powerful positions in our industry and i just wanted to you know wanted to do that um i didn't want to get a real job you know i think i was so vested into this lifestyle and in the music touring industry you know by the time i was 30 i i was like man i'm going for it like and i just had this belief and under and what i did realize is the opportunity for a master tour what you could become and and really for 15 years just it was super lean it was those you know the one nor the, you know the one thing that is um that I can draw a parallel to in a startup is everything I've read other entrepreneurs that have started businesses, those sleepless nights for years and years, you know, where yeah. every day is a survival you know, challenge. You know, there's a thing you have to decide every day for the health of the company. And there's mm-hmm. never any money. There's no money to pay anybody, anything, any roof over your head, any new carpet, you know, because the floor is leaking. I mean, there's, there was never, never money. It was, you know, this constant thing. Well, do I, do I drain one part of my savings? Do I go? to the mob to get money like what what, what do i do to keep this thing it's very chicago of you yeah yeah, yeah. that was clearly <laughs> an option. so and i just had a lot of fortunate initial support around the business to help me keep things lean you know and the the trajectory of the growth of the company was literally 10 15 years before okay. there was any realization of any success you know or any future of the business well that makes sense yeah so i mean it, it, it was a classic startup it, you know those challenges and fears and just the I mean, if I had a better memory, I could write a memoir, probably 500 pages of just the opportunities that fortunately we didn't take, <laughs> you know, from who to take money the from opportunities. to who, you know, yeah. to who to, yeah, you know, just, the, just in, you know, not suggesting anything criminal, but just these things where someone's like, okay, you need money, I'll give it to you, but I want half your company. Yeah, yeah. You made all the right choices in retrospect. Yeah. If I don't do that, I might not last another week. If I do do that, it's 50% of the company, but 50% right now is nothing. So, I mean, that's a good idea. I, we, we went back and, you know, looking back over the years and all the people and the support and the decisions, most of them not out of, out of any type of strategic planning. It was just gut on how to make the next move. And it, it just, it worked out, you know, and it, it uh, and I can't take all the credit for that at all. You know, it was, it was a lot of the initial support from friends, family, investors, you know, staff that have stuck with me for, years and years and years with promises of increasing your know, wages and better working in, you know, you know, like offices. So it's, I've been very fortunate in that capacity. It's cool to hear about where it comes from. And I, I, I think I started before we go into this any deeper, by the way, I want to ask more about yeah. master tour and the app as well. I just want to preface this with, you can correct me at any time. I have been a 
user of the app, but I haven't been an a inputter of the data. Uh, do you guys? How do you how do you differentiate those two roles within the app? Like, what do you guys call that? If that makes sense, like yeah. When I explain this to people outside our world, um, mm-hmm. when they say who uses the app, and I say well, we have a couple different levels, and kind of I, I make the you know analogy of like the executive team of a tour. You know, think of the C level team of a company. That's who uses the software. It's the okay. CEO, you know, who all say is the tour manager. It's the you know, CFO, tour accountant. It's the COO. Maybe that's the production manager. You know, so that's typically the ones that enter the information into Master Tour. All the people that are getting this information from their travel agent, the booking agencies, the record label, the business management, management, you know, they're all getting this info in various ways. They enter all this information. And, and over the years, we've made that a lot more adaptive and APIs to pull this information in, you know, from, yeah. from flight to, you know, a lot of kind of other ways to import this. Because the, the real val- big value of Master Tour is just eliminating the data entry redundancy. You know, and just the data access and, and all the historical access that you then have by having one system. Because like as I said before, you know, most you know, th- think of Andrew right, or think of any tour manager that in their career, I, I mean, man, it, it's there's only a few I can think of that have been with two bands. Most of them have been with 10 to 15 different bands, you know, with, and each band is representative of, a, you know, of a different, you know, call it entity or LLC. They have different management, business management, accounting, legal practices. Mm-hmm. They collect information differently so that you know the original interest i had in providing this was like wow if there's a you know a standard system so if you're a tour manager you go from one tour to the next everybody is comfortable with the platform of master tour they've used it there's no onboarding challenges you know it's familiar you can just say hey yeah so answer your question it's it's you know the tour management production management of the tour kind of are the pro levels and then everybody else in the crew usually are just on the mobile or the web-based, you know, yes. so they all get our, our app and it tells them everything about the tour, the month, the week, the day, their schedule, the personnel list, you know, call times, um, you know, their travel from what time to leave, you know, what time's lobby call for the tour bus, when are we, uh, you know, when's the runner picking us for... Add your guest list? Yep, guest list. Um, that was a thing that, you know, the, the original master tour was really just to create tour books. It was okay. a way that, you know, that, that was... Basically, but it was built for just here's all the data you need to generate and template out a tour book for everyone that doesn't know a tour book. Yeah, I was going to say you got to define it and you got it. Yeah. Yeah. Tour books used to be the kind of source of truth or the book of lies, as a lot of people said, because at the beginning of the tour, you get this 10 to 50 page, you know, binded little tour book. And that was a report of everything coming up for the next month, two months, four months, you know, and it's, I think the book of lies it was coined originally because by the second week, so much of that has changed because, yeah. I mean, entire dates could be added. It's an organism. Dropped. Yeah. It was always kind of the, the core information about a tour was in the tour, but Master Tour originally was built to do that. And then eventually it was like, well, if all this information is in Master Tour to generate a tour book, why don't we just encourage the usage to be more, um, you know, to have more of a, um, you know, less passive experience with it. Like, keep entering data and keep giving them opportunities to, to uh, transfer that data out. You know, so when we came up with the, the mobile app, that was a perfect example. It's basically a tour book in your hand that continually is evolving based on this information changing from dates, yeah. schedules, guest lists, you know, weather, hotels, personnel, all that stuff. Yeah. It makes much more sense in a written way. And I personally used your app. I believe actually Andrew Weiss was the first person to introduce mm. me to it. I want to say it was 2012 right when he came on right. to, team of data remember and i can personally say that it was quite clunky back then like it was definitely in the earlier stages but it worked you know like the core was yeah. there the the, the 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 important stuff was there and now i like went and did some research i haven't toured in a few years just covid some um, combined yeah. with this and stuff but yep, yep. talked to a few tour manager friends even the most recent update they said was amazing and it's so much more user friendly it's like it's insane now where you've come to so well done man yeah yeah thank you i appreciate how's it, it. how's it feel yeah. I mean, it felt amazing until about um, March of 2020. That um, it was really, it was fucking going really great until about March of 2020. All right, yeah. Bring bring us into that. Bring us into COVID. Sorry to interrupt, but I I am interested to hear how, what this looked like from your perspective. Well, I mean, it, it it's not too dissimilar from what every company person, employee employer felt. You know, in the initial parts of COVID hitting, like, wow, this is going to be a rough two weeks. Man, this yeah. is weird that we're going to be home for two weeks. Boy, I sure hope that. <laughs> you know, the uh, summer tours don't, you know, this, this June tour doesn't get canceled. So that, that reality 
onset was no different than anybody else. Um, you know, and we were way more fortunate than many, you know, as far as the company. And yeah, but yeah, I mean, co- rolling into COVID, we, I mean, we let's just say the the big we were beyond the highest point we had been in subscribers and revenue, and you know, we had built an incredible team. I expanded our team to just not just be developers, but just have really strategic thinkers in the company. You know, awesome. From, How big is your team? We're going to be. That's a good question. It, it's not. Let's. We're we're in the right about twenty. That's awesome. Congrats. That sounds like a solid solid number. Yeah, and it, it's it's something that I never imagined would get bigger than five. I'm going to say I don't imagine it getting bigger than I don't know what, but it, it's it's so right before COVID, we were kind of in that state where it was just really going great because for about two years prior to COVID, maybe three, like it really got to the point in the business like okay, like phew, this works. You know, mm-hmm. I was no longer worried about like payroll, office rent, buying touring supplies. You I was, convinced I wasn't, yourself you were successful, yes. <laughs> which takes a while. I convinced a while. myself that the company was successful. And so I was able to transfer that energy into like more growth, strategic, long-term yeah. kind of planning. You know, it, it was, it, and we just had some huge, huge, we call it the biggest opportunity a company could ever have uh, yeah. right before COVID. And a big part of the company was in Los Angeles uh, for Polestar. Um, and that was a weird poll star that year because everyone's like, "Yeah, does anyone want to talk about COVID and all this stuff <laughs> that we're hearing?" And it was it was pretty much put in the back. You no, know, I think there was one panel that mentioned it back then, if I remember. Um, so we were all just denying the impact of this, you know, this very soon immediate wave that was going to corrupt everything, you know, that we ever learned about our industry. And, and we we really were at a point in the business where it was going so well, and we were just looking at each other, giddy that we had done it finally. Yeah. And that this massive opportunity was right around the corner. We we're in Los Angeles, kind of at a, a party we were hosting, saying, like, not not arrogantly, you know, not in like a cocky way, but we're like, man, this, nothing is going to stop this, yeah. this wave. Like, we've got that energy, man. I mean, that's an important energy to have. Yeah. yeah. We're like, we've got enough. Now we have finally enough money. Now we've got the right team. We've got a critical mass of users, you know, so good luck competition, like breaking into that. Well, yeah. <laughs> and then, yeah, and then COVID hits. <laughs> and then, Right away, that's all ripped out from under you. So, can I ask something really fast? Because yeah. something that I'm asking, and if I'm asking, I'm sure some viewers are going to wonder too. How do you make money? Like, are people paying you as they use it? Because if COVID hits, like, yeah. how does that affect you guys? Uh, that completely wipes out our revenue because okay. we ask. Uh, I mean, it, it's a it's a SaaS model, subscription as a service. You know, the tour management the uh, that I mentioned earlier, they're the ones that subscribe that pay okay. monthly. The the mobile portion is free, and we have support contracts and we have bigger contracts with big management companies, record labels, promoters, you know, that we can structure more of an enterprise level solution paid once, twice a year, mm-hmm. uh, you know, with all the different support and kind of features and, and, and uh, you know, other, other kind of uh, things that we can wrap into a bigger package. But yeah, and, and we've always had this, and this is goes against a lot of the normal rules of a SaaS business. Most of the time when you stop paying, I mean, our, our policy is if you stop paying, um, you can't use the software, you can't access the data, but as soon as you start paying, whether that's a week later or five years later, all your old data is there. Right back where you left off, baby. Yeah. <laughs> right where you left. And we, and we don't, we don't, you know, hijack, we don't hold hostage that data. We don't make them pay like a monthly thing to archive yeah. it. You know, we, and, and cause we came from the industry, we understood, you know, that there's going to be weeks, months where tours aren't running. Tour managers don't have their jobs uh, or in between jobs and they just don't need to pay us. I mean, you know, you know this, like there's, there's touring folks that can take an entire year off for various reasons. So COVID hit. And I mean, to the day I, I was asked this recently, I don't remember what day it was, but if you look at our growth chart, it's always been like this, you know, it dips yeah. in Q4. Zoom out. It just looks like this. <laughs> yeah. If you I mean, it literally for 10 years, it's, you know, right at the end of the year, there's a little drop because typically touring in Q4 in the winter is lighter. And that's, that's flattened a lot more as we've gotten more international tours, more tours that aren't just bands. You know, we have gotcha. circuses and ballets and air shows and motocross oh, wow. and book tours and celebrity, you know, uh, actors that have book, you know, that have that publicity tours, sports teams. So it's, it's still about 80% like good old rock and roll or bands on stage. We have, we have a puppet show, a touring puppet show that signs up you know, recently. So it's all different things that of, of touring. So understandably, um, no one was touring. Everyone, you know, immediately. I mean, if you remember, it, you know, we we had just for the first April May of 2020 it was just hundreds and hundreds of users a day just yeah. dropping. And, and again, understandably, 
And there's nothing like, you know, not one person within our organization was like, make them pay. Like, no, like we understand touring stop. Like, because, you know, way more than half of our users pay us themselves because they're with five different tours a year and it's just a cost of doing business. And it's yeah enough money, but not enough money to invoice over five different entities, you know, break it down. And so, and a lot of times it's management companies, a lot of times it's small bands that pay us through their small band funds in our operation. So we never thought, yeah, we to survive, we're just going to have to keep charging. I mean, that wasn't on the table. You know, I said before, like we were one of the lucky ones. I mean, we're a software company. We don't have, you know, 10,000 square feet of inventory that just sits. Buses to store, something like that. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, I mean, the, the, the bus company is, you know, bus catering. That, that yeah. I mean, those guys got just hit so hard compared to what we had to do. You know, we just unfortunately had to let uh, half of our staff off. Um, that was painful. We had to furlough a lot. We had to cut salaries way more than half. And like back to saying the luck appreciation that I have for the crew, the core crew that I've had, you know, core crew that I've had still that everybody in the industry knows as well as that, you know, is me. Mm -hmm. Been with me, you know, eight, 10, 15 years. They're in it for the long run, whether or not they're yeah. making money or not, they're here because yeah. they believe in it. And yeah. same, like, just and, like you. you know, right before COVID, like I was able to get, you know, for the most part, everything up to competitive rates. You know, we were finally looking, feeling, breathing like a real company and paying accordingly. So when COVID hit, that was a very difficult thing. Like, hey, guys, uh, you know, here's where we're at. Obviously, look outside. There's no, nothing there. You know, our revenue has dropped 85, 90%. Which makes sense. Yeah. And it, what doesn't make sense is the 10, 50% that was still paying them. Like, <laughs> Did they just forget? Were those just people who had forgot? <laughs> yeah. And it wasn't, you know, we weren't overly aggressive to remind people that they were paying. But we did make sure that the people that wanted to suspend suspended. Yeah, I mean it was very it was very clear, and, and it, it it turns out most of the, the people that were paying technically had paid a year in advance. I mean we, gotcha. we refunded a ton of people that you know the poor guys that you know paid for a year in advance in January of 2020. They're like I need rent money. Yeah, so we you know, we we refunded a, a criminal amount of money to not criminal but a, a very supportive amount of money to people, understandably that that we knew were paying it for themselves, that we knew needed that money, um, even though we did too. So, and the other fortunate thing, like, you know, aside from headcount, you know, our, our, our landlords here at the building under, immediately like, hey, pay us what you can. Like, yeah. we understand, you know, we know you're good That's for awesome. it all. Like, when things kick back, you're going to pay us back, which we have. And, you know, just recently we paid back all of the rent on it. Um, and then just the, the, the PPP funding, you know, through the local and federal government was amazing. I mean, hey, small company, fill out a two-page application and we'll send you hundreds, thousands of dollars, like in a week. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was, it was amazing. It was absolutely amazing uh, what that program did for my company and th hundreds of thousands of other, you know, hopefully all legitimate small businesses that it just bridged that gap of staying in business or closing shop, which that it did for us. I mean, if we didn't have that funding, um, I wouldn't expect the ability for any of my staff to stay on because at some point, and these are amazingly talented people that could have gotten jobs even during COVID, but they yeah. decided to stick with it. So that was a, you know, one of those things that, yeah, you know, just super fortunate, lucky to have, you know, for such a big ask like that. Yeah. And I was going to say that, like, I like the way that you do business. And I think that the situations you've gone through and the experiences you've had are really show the importance of, you know, doing business the right way, working with people for the right reasons, because all these people, like you've built such a strong support system. There's no way that they're leaving at something like this. And COVID definitely put people to the test. And I'm actually really yeah. interested to hear about the things that you're seeing from your point of view. Like, first, I want to kind of understand, like, what you guys predicted. Like, obviously, COVID's happening and it's going on. Like, we're maybe past the point of we're coming to terms of like, OK, this is longer than we thought a year or two in. What did you guys anticipate was going to happen when touring started back up? Because I feel like you see the raw data, like you see it in a way that yeah. nobody else can see it on a scale that also nobody else can see. Yeah, I mean, you know, although when when no one was entering the data, there was nothing to analyze there. Yeah, like every day, be, you, you know, I open up my computer, be like, yeah, no one's using the data. There's still no users. You know, if you remember that, that mainly that first year and a half of it. I mean, the the first, you know, if you break COVID down like into four quarters. Yeah, you know, the first for the touring industry, almost the first entire half of COVID was just this um, constant rescheduling of shows and tours. Yeah. Not coming to terms with the fact that it's going to be long. Right. 
Yeah, not based in reality. And, and But there wasn't data to prove that the reality was this is going to be a solid shutdown for two years. Yeah. Uh, we, we weren't getting that from the government. We weren't getting that from you know health officials, the analysts. Nobody said definitively this is going to be exactly when things are going to collapse completely and when to you know, start rebounding. So, I mean, for the first half of COVID, it, and man, no one was working really in our industry except for the mm-hmm. booking agents. I mean, they were they were working their asses <laughs> off. And amazingly, think of what they had to do. They had to sit there and reschedule, you know, I think an average Can't of imagine. three times. Yeah. I mean, imagine that. You've got massive arena club theater shed tours, you know, eight month long tours. And they, you know, they first got pushed back a month then four months, then a year, you know, think of the challenges the ticketing companies had not, uh, you know, of the refund policies of fans that are just like the third time it was rescheduled. I mean, it's funny going to shows now and there's a huge, I mean, it, it's not a great situation, but it's, it, it, some fans aren't just showing up to show, some consumers aren't showing up to shows they purchased tickets for two and a half years ago because yeah. they've just kind of forgotten or they've lost interest or they moved, life happens, they're working. Life yeah. happened. Yeah. You know, or they're in a different market now where they just hate the band that they bought tickets <laughs> for you know, two and a half years ago. Uh, so I think in some cases, there's been like 20% of no-shows, you know, in, in, yeah. in some of these things. And mostly on the smaller side, you, know, you buy a show for 200, you know, the, uh, a show for 200 cap room and it's in six months before COVID. And then two and a half years later, that $40 that you spent, you know, and like you said, you're out, you've moved, you've married, yeah. you've died. I don't know what it is, but you're just not showing up. The only thing that we knew that when touring did resume, our customers would come back because overwhelmingly the people that we talked to would say, hey, it's, you know, it's not you, it's not me, it's COVID. Um, I still love you, Master Tour. And when touring, my first, the very first, I mean, we had people say the most exciting thing they had in the last two years when they renewed their Master Tour account because that meant they had a job. That meant they're going back yeah. on the road. That means something they familiar. To see the break. Yeah. So we, we didn't really do anything over the course of two years except manage you know, making sure we didn't go under. And there was still, even with the co- even with the PPP funding, there was not knowing how long this was going to last. You know, you get this massive amount of money from the government and it's not like things are back to normal. It's like, well, man, we don't know if this is a year, two year, three year thing. We don't know when COVID is technically over. Who, like, who is going to be, uh, what's that going to look like? You know, you remember that, I mean, there was a big kick towards streaming. I think, you know, some people in the industry thought that was like going to save a lot. Yeah, or it, it, all of them. It, it was just going to save life, because which made sense. I've always been, you know, had, had my feelings about streaming as far as completely replicating the live experience. I've always eventually got into the streaming business for a year and got out of it, fortunately, because that wasn't kind of we we realized just stay in our lane, do what we know. Yeah, you know, not not start producing concerts, but um, you know, so th- for the first part of it, everyone from Live Nation, everything was investing a lot of money in streaming, thinking, well, this makes perfect sense. If fans can't go out. The next best thing, if not the best thing, is uh, streaming a live show. And, and you remember, some of these big bands would go into productive facilities with no fans in the audience and do live shows and stream. Remember, there was a big drive-in component. Oh you yeah, know, so all these weird. drive-in theaters, so, <laughs> yeah, across the country. You drive in your car, and then you, you hear stay the, in your circle you know, outside your car or something. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. There was all those tents, you know, those kind of bubbles that you could go into, you know, to or you could go to Florida safely. And have a yeah, normal show. Florida, but yeah, COVID yeah. didn't hit Florida, so they yeah. were still super lucky for that. <laughs> um, but you know, we we didn't have any data to prove anything. We you know we were we weren't thinking too far ahead, even to the point of I had a gut that when our customers' friends came back to touring, they didn't want a completely new master tour. You know, they wanted to see exactly what they saw when they turned it off. You know, in April of 2020, they they just wanted to pop it back up, wipe off the dust. I think we surprised them with a few little features, but all the buttons were in the same place. Their login didn't change. All their data was there. You know, we were saying like, let's let's really focus on just cleaning up the back end, kind of the you know the closets of Master Tour. Let's make sure. Let's use this opportunity to like just yeah, some downtime, some downtime, and just make sure that all of the things that aren't sexy that are under the hood are working better and faster. So when they pop back in, um, I, I thought, and it's proven to be true that when the industry came back, it was just going to be a tidal wave. Of activity it's everything at once <laughs> it's yeah. like everything i mean, I mean fans once. customers i mean everybody wants to go out I, I don't know it will stop you know we can't sustain this there's enough tour buses to sustain this i don't think people have enough physical mental energy to sustain the amount of shows that are out i think you know it's been since march that everything's really kicked in here for us so i mean I, 
when it's 2020. I, I mean, when did COVID end? Was there um, our data depends what state March, you live in? <laughs> yeah. But there was one week all of a sudden where everything kicked back in for us. Like, like noticeably, it just skyrocketed yeah. off. I think that's when it was uh, like a early this list. year. Uh, what is it? September? Yeah, it was March. I think it's early this year. I want to say it was like, yeah, yeah. or th- when people were like, okay, are we going on another year now? Like that kind of vibe was right yeah. then. But it was this year, right? I I, th- I feel like this could have been 10 years ago, but it was this year, March. That's when everything was, and there was some federal release of, of restrictions, you know, mm-hmm. in capacity restrictions, I think. And then, because because I remember before that, the August, September of 2021, um, I mean, Lollapalooza here in Chicago was fully open. You know, mm-hmm. that, in, you know, that was kind of right before Omicron. It was like between Delta and Omicron. And, yeah, it got worse in like December, January. I remember like everything. Yeah. That's, yeah. Yeah, because I remember Lollapalooza went off with, out of hitch. Like 10 people got COVID, you know, out of 80,000. Yeah. And, but then by the time Riot Fest happened, you know, which would have been um, two months later, that was weird again. No, you know, everything was closed. Everyone was wearing masks. Like Riot Fest barely happened. Yeah. Um, and then everyone was like, man, screw this. We're not going to risk the investment of putting a tour on the road. Let's just wait till spring, March, 2022. And I think the attitude was like, if it doesn't work then, then man, let's all find your jobs. Like let's, let's all get, let's all go to banking. People are exhausted, man. Yeah. But, but fortunately, you know, I think that was the timing of exhaustion of the realities of what COVID was and could do. And then just the fatigue, you know, yeah. and the, the, the kind of the risk reward of, yeah, I find going into a closed room now with, you know, 8,000 other people screaming, spitting, dancing, moshing, like on top of you. I mean, I'm sure you remember your first show going back to after COVID in a live packed room. It was pretty awkward. You know, you're sitting there just like, ah, I don't know about this. You know, I feel kind of, I'm, I'm loving the, you know, seeing live music again, but it was kind of weird. And now, I mean, the show, I've been to 50 shows since then, and it's, I don't even think it's a, I mean, you see people with masks, fine. I, no yeah. problem. Parents are sick. They might have an autoimmune disease. Like I get totally it. Like understand. you got to do your thing. Yeah. Yeah. The guy riding with a mask on a bike down through Chicago. Um, <laughs> I don't understand that guy. It's cold, man. It's cold. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. In August. Yeah. With a little <laughs> mask that questionably worked anyway, even during yeah. COVID. So yeah, it's, it's been super exciting. It's, 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 uh, you know, you know, we're back way above, um, normal business. Um, we're busier than ever. You know, we put things that we tabled uh, kind of back on the product roadmap. You know, we're announcing um, next year. I mean, we're announcing it now, but we're getting into the venue side of the business so that we're, we're releasing a, a master tour for venues. Everybody's on master tour. It's going to be so much easier. Oh, my well, God. That, the, the idea and that, that was kind of the original vision 20 years ago was, yeah. you know, we'd have master tour, master agency, master label, master venue, master, you know, caterer, you know, master. Uh, payroll and just have all these things that could point to the same and and all of those still make sense there's some realities on what kind of facets of your factions of the industry would and would not use a centralized system Um, but the one that's most obvious that we see you know still the most pain in kind of operational and antiquated systems is the venue side um so soon you have the ability to advance production advance so you know for everybody outside the industry you know when a show gets booked all of this intel goes to the tour and then it's up to the tour the tour management production management to go you know reach out to the venue and say, Hey, we're the band. Uh, mm-hmm. We're going to show up. I need to make sure you have a stage, you have lights, you have food, you have dress rooms, you have truck parking that are, you know, in towels. a thousand, a, we need towels. Yeah, a thou- literally a thousand things. <laughs> and right now the tour is reaching out to 30 venues in the course of a small tour. And each venue has a different way of getting back. To them. And it's still phone calls, texts, emails, um, no system. So you I got mom and pop venues. You got young people yeah. running them. Everybody's got their favorite yeah. way of doing the faxing you things. Who knows? No, it, it, a lot of the ways they're doing it are good, but yeah. it's just not, you know, they're not consistent, you know, inconsistency, you know, lack of consistency or template kills efficiencies and um, just, you know, totally screams for redundant data entry, which causes mistakes. And these are big mistakes that can cost thousands, tens of thousands of dollars. I heard once a mistake costs hundred. Fifteen thousand dollars because something wasn't planned properly at a big arena show. They're right, PM instead of AM. Yeah, right. That's always baked into the budget. You know these yeah. losses. So we want to make it so that the venues and tours can advance through one system. All of the technical packages that the venues produce are the same. You know, so mm-hmm. if you're a tour and you advance thirty different uh, rooms, 
each room has the same tech pack. So you know exactly where to go. And all that information is digitized and it's searchable and it's archived. And then we're really excited to kind of start providing the venues with more tools just on the operational side, managing their guest list, managing their onboarding personnel, hiring, scheduling, not anything to do with the contract side, but just like how do you operate yourself as a venue from staff to schedule, you know, to operations. And then all that information will be readily available for people booking or, you know, having their show at the venue yeah. and all the pieces will be able to talk to each other. And it sounds yep. like a spreadsheet I wish I could like bask in and just look at because that sounds amazing. Yeah. Like, I just love yeah. that data. That sounds so it's so nice because tour managers have the hardest job ever already. You're like, oh, you advance what? Everything. Oh, OK. Well, and, yeah. But they're also responsible for handing the artist towels when they get on stage, you know, and that's, you know, in a, a tour manager's role is, you know, I, I'm never going to call it a babysitter, but it, it's it's really a big part of the job is kind of creating a comfortable environment for their artists on the road. And, you know, again, it's, it's, there's not a lot of sympathy, I think, from the outside world for A-list artists that need their towels handed to them in a particular way. But it's, it's mostly not because, you know, they're prima donnas. It's because just giving any artist, small or big, a sense of normalcy to the day. If the yeah. dressing room doesn't, you know, if the dressing room can look the same every day, it can feel like their living room that they come home to at night. That can seem excessive to a lot of people. But man, if I was an A-list artist, you know, I'd pull the same shit as J-Lo does. I'm like, I want every, you know, I want as much as I can. I want, you know, I want to see things the way I want to see it. I, yeah. I, I think that's totally understandable um, as long as you're treating everybody else on the road fairly and, it, you know, make it normal for people, you know, make it comfortable. The other, the other great thing we want to do is make a, you know, we have hundreds and thousands of users now uh, in profiles. So we, what we want to do, you know, in the big, really gap in our industry is is big services from healthcare to payroll to um you know mental health services to you know facility local amenities and facilities that they take advantage when they're away from home and on the road. So next year we're also releasing kind of an extended version of our master profile, which will allow hopefully we can you know kind of take these multiple hundreds of thousands of users in the group and make things like payroll and healthcare um, and services that are available to these people more accessible. Because, you know, there's hundreds, you know, right now, like today in Chicago, there's probably 500, 600 touring people in town from different parts of the world, you know, and they're in Chicago. And for the most part, it's the, it's a city that they don't have any familiarity with to the extent of what's outside of the venue that they're playing with. And where Chipotle is. Yeah, right. Where's, you know, where is the great, you know, guitar store, where's, you know, a bookstore, where is, you know, a great after show food place, where is a place to get mental health or, you know, things that, um, and that's another great thing I'm seeing in our industry is the just understanding and the encouragement to not bottle stuff in, you know, not to, not to keep everything inside. I mean, this is a very stressful industry. Um, there is, I can't remember, I think it was like two and three people on the road, you know, have, have, various levels of different kind of mental health issues and depression and these and there's for the most part historically no one to reach out to on the road because it was a sign of weakness you know that you couldn't do your job and you couldn't handle the stress and that's a big thing that you know is being changed by some great people and organizations that needs further change in the industry just to provide that support on the road for there's no other place to get it you know when you're away from your home for you know five weeks to two years you know there's nothing really accessible like that. And I think that's going to, that's, that's a great investment into our industry, you know, taking care of the people in it. I had a guest on here once, Mike Finn, who was like, I don't go on tour because I like yeah. to go places. It's like, it's just because I like to run away from things. I'm sure you know, Mike. <laughs> and I was like, all right, man, I, 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 I made like a book proposal for this podcast. Like it's, that's what I'm trying to write a book on touring. I am writing. And I put that quote in there because I was like, Mike, this yeah. is just too good. Like that sums up people's feeling in a way. No, it's true. I mean, if, if it's done correctly, it's an amazing lifestyle. You know, if you yeah. save properly, if you set the expectations of family, loved ones, and probably give away any sense of a relationship, you know, if you're a pr really pro pro that's going to be on the road full time. So yeah, that's, that's pretty true. I mean, it's, it's a, uh, it, it's, I mean, it's a brute, it's a, brutal lifestyle but it's incredibly rewarding too because of the responsibilities you can get yeah pretty quickly you know and you, you think about the teams that run you know these many million dollar a night organizations you know, with hundreds of people on the tour and it's it's way more challenging than you know being a ceo of a 250 uh, regular company you know this is a traveling city every single day every single day is a new you know kind of a new environment you have to resurrect this company you know to support and uh, take care of everything, you know, all the people and all the requirements within it. It's it's nothing like anything else. 
Yak Bielik, sometimes people spend half their career getting on, the, half their touring career getting on the road and the other half getting off the road. They're like, okay, I really yeah. want to do this. All right, now I want a family. And it's just like touring happens oh, yeah. for a small time in between. Yep. I have a nephew that is just getting into the touring industry. He's 18 and I'm saying to him, like, you know, you're probably going to be doing this for the next like 40 years. Like, once <laughs> you get in, I mean, he's, he's proper touring like around the country. I'm like, that's, you're going to be stuck. Like once you yeah. get in, to, I, I try to, you know, I've known so many friends that have tried to get out to get regular jobs. And man, fun. at some point, some point they get the ask, you know, that, that perfect, uh, you know, two years later, they get that call from someone be like, man, I know you're out, but we could really use you just for two weeks, man, two weeks. And you'll be right, you'll be right back home. Then four years later. <laughs> Yeah, that's what that's what Weiss said. He's that you're either in and out and not it's either for you and you're out right away or or excuse me, it's not for you and you're out right away or it's for you and you're in for yeah. life. And I was like, yeah. all right, Weiss, give me some more quotes, man. He's just full of those. Every time I talk to him, I'm yeah. like, all right, you got to I just got to write these down. Yeah, it's amazing. It's cool how many mutual friends we have. And I'm sure there's people we don't even know that we both know. And it's just nice being oh, able to I'm mention sure. somebody. And you'd be like, oh, yeah, right. I, I know them. They're a, yeah. or you could probably just look them up. Yeah, well, that's, I mean, we want to do this, again, within the constraints of, you know, the user's um, consent and opt yeah, in. Yeah. But we, we, have, we have a community here. You know, I don't, I, you know, there's so many times, like, this weekend, you know, just in Chicago, we'll probably have 50, you know, different tours in Master Tour. That's so crazy. 20 plus different, well, let's call it, I don't know, call it even 20 different bands in town this weekend using Master Tour. I guarantee you 50% of those tours know each other and know the yeah. crew each other, have toured with each other, have, you know. Don't know they're in town. Yeah, we're trying to figure out a way to say, hey, I mean, especially when you think of festivals, when, you know, they don't know who's the touring with Metallica now, or you don't know who's touring out with Dua Lipa, but uh, it, imagine if some way we could connect all our users and be like, oh, wow, Andrew's in town, you know, especially when it's an unannounced show, like in a rehearsal facility or something. We have a master tour entrance. A master tour entrance to every venue where you go with the app, you scan in, and then you just meet people who are at that show as well. Yeah, well, we do. Uh, a few times a year, we, we co-produce a, a gathering of, of friends, you know, in L.A. and Nashville. And we just think oh, anybody cool. that's touring, anybody that's touring can come to this. We, you know, because we want to support the touring community. We, we want to try to give this environment. It's very hard to find a date that enough people aren't touring, you know, in yeah. a specific market. But we'll get a couple hundred people that show up, you know, and they're all, it's family. Father's Day. Yeah, right. Yeah, <laughs> that's right in the heart of summer, man. No one's gonna, no one's gonna be home for that. <laughs> I know. I was just making. I was trying to make a really bad joke or something. I don't know. It's yeah, right. Good. But it's, hey, you're finally home for Father's Day. Come yeah. to LA for a party. Yeah. Come do the thing. Oh man. Well, thanks for hopping on here. I, that hour went by really fast. I feel like nothing went as planned, but that's okay yeah. because everything was enjoyable and it was good. And I, I hope that it was for you as well. Yeah, no, I, I love it. It's uh, it's great to be on this. It's great to be talking about um, the industry and seeing people out there again. I wanted to say I have two more questions I have to ask you. Or I want to ask okay. you. When I was doing research for you, I found like older videos, and you didn't always have facial hair, right? This was like, oh or, yeah, yeah. What caused you to go facial hair? Because it looks really good, and I'm kind of Thank getting you. to that point in my life. I don't know if I can get a full everything, but when were you like, all right, I need to do it, man? I think. Yeah, I, there was no exact point. There was no. Okay. Uh, uh, oh, you know when it was? It was when I realized that I could grow facial hair. I think that's when I started growing a beard. You're like, wait, it connects. It all connects. Yeah, I can't really get this cranking, but okay, um, you know, I, I can't get the the big burly, you know, um, mountain beard. But um, yeah, there was no. There's let's just say there's certain people in my life that really would like to see the beard go away. But uh, I like it. You know, it it helps hide things as you get to my age. I can't grow a full one and I don't know. I just didn't understand just that when it. I was younger. I was like, wait, right. you don't just get the facial hair. It's like hit well, or miss. You, you were five. I mean, you were <laughs> five. Come on. You got you to wait a little longer than that. I know. Right? Um, I don't know. Yeah. Yes. So thank you. Yeah. I'm going to tell my wife, you said keep it. So it should be very good. <laughs> That'll go. Last question though. Shower shoes or no shower yeah. shoes when you tour? What's the vibe? We ask everybody. Yeah, I, oh, shower shoes. Are you a shower shoes think, kind of guy? I think when you ask that question, it's usually too late. Like when you're like, man, I really <laughs> wish I had shower shoes. It's because like you're showering, you, you, you find a shower like in a CBGB's type room yeah. or something. It's, um, I don't know what, you know, sometimes I'm like shower shoes, but then you got to put the shower shoes in the bag somewhere. So yeah. what's grosser? Weiss just wears I, them I'm, all the time. Yeah. I, and then I'm like, man, if you're going to like, that's, I don't like thinking about how disgusting everything is because if you really knew that data and you've really walked around with a, a blue light or a black light, like in your life, you'd never want to leave like a padded room again. So 
putting stuff on my feet in the shower. I'm like, oh, what's going to go? Do your worst. <laughs> shower cleanliness rating for the eight for the uh, for the reviews of the venues in Master Tour. You have to be like, that, all right, it, 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 no, that's in the works. I'm, at, I'm dead serious. <laughs> there's comment boards. There's, you know, we want every venue to because that can help the venue. If the venue yeah. might not know that the artists are afraid to go anywhere near the bathroom because you know it's disgusting. Um, yeah, it's it's typically like even in nice nice rooms, man. Just the idea of twenty other you know crew band in the shower that day. It's but again, man. Sometimes that first shower in three days, it's like man, put me anywhere as long as yeah, I can. Give me use. a hose. Yeah, Let's go. right, right. Well, it's really no, nice meeting you, Paul. Yeah, I love the title of your uh, of your your podcast here. That's <laughs> thank cool. you. We got to get people in general, somehow. We got to get them in. Well, you know? it's, it's funny because I, you know we just moved offices and uh, we're in a great classic music building in Chicago in Bucktown, right by Club Lucky. Everybody knows it. Every music company, every band's toured in this thing at some point. There's studios in here, so we moved into this great part of the third floor. Finally, there's bathrooms outside, but we have one bathroom in the office. Okay. And I think, you know, I don't want to, but we have to have that same tour bus roll. Yeah. I think that's fair, right? Just, just other places, take the rest like home. Go into, take the rest home or go downstairs, but just, I'm going to somehow introduce that same policy. It's, it's kind of in the, in the same spirit of the classic, you know, tour bus, no number two rule. I'll send you a sticker if you want. We'll have to cross out bus First, right yeah. here, but you know, wait, I'm looking yeah, at right. Bucktown. <laughs> it's kind of by Lincoln Park. Like to the uh, left? Not really. We're kind no. of, um, I mean, everybody in the industry will know where it is based on venues. So we're by Congress Theater, Subterranean, the old double oh, door. Yeah. You know, we're Congress not too Theater. Far from, is it still open? Yeah. That thing, I don't know for I 20 years. Shut it's down. Been, it's <laughs> been shut down five times. It's been opened 10. So there was, oh, uh, there's been a, in, there's been a mostly hidden history of that venue. Um, and most of it you probably don't want to know, but uh, I don't know if it's currently open. A great room. I mean, it's one of those classic, you know, early so nice. 1900s, beautiful rooms. Uh, yeah, when Double Door shut, that was a, you know, that was a big hit to the Chicago scene because that was such a classic venue. One of the most classic venues in the city. Man, I just got to go to the most classic venue in the entire world, uh, Metro. And oh, my God. Smashing, uh, Smashing Pumpkins two nights ago did a uh, surprise show. That's that pretty. Metro like, always has those shows. So I was like, oh, by no, the way, we know it, this no, band. It, They're going to play here. Mike Ham. No, because Joe Shanahan built you know, most of the industry and gave bands like Nirvana and Foo Fighters and REM and Pumpkins, my band, all that first shot opportunity. My band didn't end up working like the other ones, but Joe Shanahan is a legend in our business and many bands careers are, you know, he's responsible for. So when I, I think that's an honor at any level of size band to play at Metro. Yeah. Agreed, man. Yeah. I miss my childhood sometimes. That was fun. Yeah, well, uh, <laughs> that was like it was like being 25 again. Like it was a flashback. Seeing the pumpkins in that room was like 1995. All the same people were there, just 30 years older. <laughs> was your partner mixing them? Or whatever? No, but man, I'm, he probably would have if he, he was still, itching. Still out with Dave. I'm sure he felt it. I was. I texted him pictures of some of the old crew that you know that still work there, or you know, were friends of ours back in the 90s. That's it was. Cool. Uh, it was. It was like a home going. It was like a family reunion in a weird way. Oh man. Well, I look forward to yeah. hopefully meeting you in real life. Uh, I yeah, do. I frequent the Midwest, so you know I'll shoot you a text okay. if I'm if I'm by that area. And if you're ever in LA or you guys have one of those parties, and I I haven't toured in a while, but uh, I'd love to come. We'll let you know. Yeah, we're All having right. that touring party right right before Polestar this year again. So if you've toured most for the most part, you're invited, unless you're on someone's yes. you know bad boy list or not naughty yet. list. <laughs> not yet, not yet. All right, thank All right. you, Paul. All right, take Great. care. Yeah, for sure.